Nous allons poursuivre avec euh, donc, euh, trois nouvelles intervenantes que je, que je remercie ici. Donc, euh, Sylvia Antonio Nejar, vous êtes euh, historienne de l'art. Vous avez partagé votre vie avec euh, le sculpteur et peintre euh, norvégien Karl Nejar, qui fut euh, l'un des derniers collaborateurs euh, de Picasso et qui euh, euh, a exécuté notamment... Le, les, euh, les agrandissements euh, en béton euh, de sculptures de Picasso, euh, donc euh, en Norvège, en Suède, en Europe et euh, aux États-Unis, notamment. Euh, vous allez revenir sur aujourd'hui sur la rencontre de euh, Nejar avec Picasso en 1957, excusez-moi, dans le sud de la France. Hello everybody. This is going to be a more of a, um, not really an art historical uh, uh, presentation. It's going to be more of a personal. And because I lived with the man that worked with Picasso for 17 years, the last, few, the last years of his life. And it was actually very interesting that Diana and um, um, Madame um, came before me because that leads right directly into my husband's life with Picasso. Think if it is difficult to fold a piece of paper, and then it gets more difficult to fold a piece, a sheet of metal. And then if it's, how it, more difficult it comes. Now we are going from a few inches to 15 meters, and in concrete and it looks folded. And that's what Carl Nechard did for Picasso. They met, first of all, the beginning of 1957, after which Carl was, since he met Picasso in the beginning of 1957, he went over to the Musée Picasso, then the uh, Chateau, um, uh, Chateau de Castille. Yes, uh, in, in Antibes, and he saw Picasso's huge mural with uh, the, um, the satyr, dancing faun, and centaur from 1946. That became the third of a huge mural in the government buildings in, in, in Oslo. In the picture, uh, you will see Picasso with the architect of the government buildings in Oslo. His name is Erling Bixche, and he and an engineer found this process where they could use concrete to make very, very thin elements. And that was because they could mix uh, the, the uh, uh, pebbles and also a special mix of cement that contained many chemicals that could dry fast and so on. On top of that, they found out how to use colored and color it. Not a lot of color, but color it. So in 1957, Carl Nashar, pushed by Erling Bixer, the architect of the Govern building, decided that he was going to go to, to come to southern France and find Picasso. Out of the blue. Naive. Huh. Yeah, so he did that. By chance, by chance, he met at a party, he met a young man called Eugene Fiddler who happened to be a friend of Picasso's. They were at a cocktail party, and, and Carl could not find Picasso. He tried the phone, he tried this, he tried that, all the contacts, all the, the uh, he could find, but nothing. And here comes Fiddler, and he says, I know Picasso. Why don't we go up to the cafe and call and see if we can get, it, get, him, get him to meet you? Well, they went to the cafe, but no, no, no luck. They couldn't find him, but Fiddler promised that he would get in touch with Picasso. And on the 20th of January, a Saturday, they went to Picasso's house. He and uh, uh, Fiddler, his wife, and a young baby, and Carl Nishar. And to begin with, when first Pica uh, Fiddler in introduced Picasso, he said, je vous présente en Norvégien. And to Carl Nishar's surprise, Picasso said, Ça, ça, ça c'est déjà pas mal. And Carl was very surprised when he heard this. 
to be good, to be Norwegian, because Norwegians are known as like square heads in America. They're not sort of well, uh, little naive people and so on, few, few people also. But to be accepted right away as to be good. And little did Carl know that he was the second Norwegian that, Carl, that Picasso had met. The first was, um, the first was um, uh, a, 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 a painter, a Norwegian painter that was in the Paris at the beginning of the 20th century and who showed at the academy and became very popular and very wealthy and supported the young, young uh, artists at that time, among them Picasso. And he would only, not only support him financially, but also morally, to be there at their exhibitions, to, meet, to have them meet people, to have them meet uh, collectors and so on. That Carl found out later. And think that Picasso was impressed and had faith in the first Norwegian to continue to have faith in the second. And that's what happened. So then, on that first, at that first meeting, Carl had with him a letter from a newly, a, newly, uh, a newly formed art club in Norway that uh, commissioned works of art, uh, mainly prints, from young and older artists that they bought the whole, the, the whole for example, the whole um, edition and then gave the artists a little bit of money and sold the rest the rest to Norwegian, to the Norwegian public. This was part of the Norwegian uh, uh, Labour Party at the time. And so he had a letter from this uh, uh, art club asking Picasso for uh, 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 an edition of, of 250 lithographs. Again, surprisingly, Picasso said, OK, you can have it. And he said, and, and, they come, and Picasso said to him, come back later and you'll get the drawing. Before they were leaving, Fiddler pushed Carl and said, why don't you show him the drawings of what you're doing at the government building? The government building, Carl said, well, Carl, come on. No, 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 he said, Fiddler. He is interested in new techniques. And he will like that. So Carl took out photographs. Next. Yeah, then this, this is, the, repre the, this is the, the, the lithograph that they did. And then he showed him photographs of what they were doing in the government building. This is one of Carl's drawings. This is cement. The, uh, this is the, the cement, which now has a dark stone behind it and white cement front. So they can uh, gra uh, engrave the, the white cement, which is softer and very, very fine, so they can get a design. Next. They also were working in color because they were experimenting. They really didn't know what it was all about. And, and, and in a way, it was quite new for that time, and also that an architect had been given such great power with a huge building, a government building, which is also the, uh, the, um, the parliament building. Anyway, so he showed these photographs to Picasso. There's another one. Mm -hmm. And then you can see here where now he's used white, he, they have used white pebbles and black, black colored cement so they can get the difference to see. So when Picasso saw these, he took them and he ran into the kitchen, told the cook, stop everything, you have to look at this. Then he ran out to the garden and said, stop everything, you're going to have to look at this. And then it was, he, Carl said he was like putting a big th a needle into his bottom and then he jumped up and did this. It was, he was so excited. He came back into the house, and they started ask, 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 asking questions. Now, like Laura's, like uh, Tiola, it was like a new thing for him. He was looking for somebody to make things bigger, to make things more permanent. And here comes this man right after Tiola and gives him the possibility. And he said, I'm interested in doing some work in this, uh, in this, uh, 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 in this, um, technique, yeah, but I want to see something finished. In the meantime, he took, he didn't like the colored stuff. He liked only the gray and blue, the, the gray and black, the, uh, the white and black. And he said, come back. So Carl went, came back to Norway 
and finished a couple of walls. And then when he went to fetch the sketch for the, uh, for the lithograph, he took along the photographs. And that was now in June 1957. They met in January 1957. And Picasso gave him the sketch for the lithograph and two sketches for two walls in the government building. This is the first one. Picasso was very, very demanding in many ways. And he was also a very good uh, teacher for Carl because he uh, started him off with the easy, from easy to hard. And this was the easiest. And it was an easy design. And also for Norway, it was, according to Picasso, it was symbolic because Norway was the land of the sea. And uh, the next one also had to do with the land of the sea, fishermen. You see, we didn't have the oil in Norway at that time. We only had the fish. I think we're going back to the fish now because oil is going to be finished soon. But in any case, Picasso again thought of a symbolic thing to give him, fishing, because Norway at that time was known for fishing and for the, 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 the Navy. And so now how did this work? Picasso said, you go, take these, try them out. But you have to come back with photographs for me if I like them, that's fine, they can stay. If not, you have to erase. And that was easy to do, because all he would, Carl would do would take the sandblasting gun and just erase everything. Because that cement surface is very soft, and it can be erased. As a matter of fact, later you will see that he did erase one. OK? Now, the next, on that, at that same time in, 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 in June, in, uh, actually, it was in, uh, yes, in June nine, 1957, Picasso showed Carl some of the small sculptures. I don't know th which one. This, this is supposed to be a, a, a metal tube with paper wings and so on. And he had placed these small figures underneath. So Carl understood immediately that he wanted three-dimensional, yes, three-dimensional things, yes. and. He, went, he came back to Oslo, he went back to Oslo, and, they, uh, and uh, he, the, the engineer and the architect said we could try it out. He went back to Picasso, Picasso said yes, again, only on the condition that if, it, if he didn't like it, it would be also destroyed. Well, um, it did, uh, yes. In the meantime, they, he, he gave him, he, he, Picasso consented to giving him the, uh, the consent to do the three figures from Antibes. Now, Carl did that, and here is the first trial. He wasn't happy with it. And then he erased it completely and did another wall. And he wasn't happy with the second wall. And then he took away the figure of the centaur and took the photograph back to Picasso, again, which he signed. And that was their contract for that, for the murals. And this is the building now that these three murals are uh, in, and that's the building that was bombed, and it's being also now uh, uh, rehab rehabilitated. And then later on, hmm, he did a, a building that the same engineer built to the side, and they, Picasso gave him the drawing for this, which he also executed, and then of course the big, beautiful outdoors one, which now the, the, uh, the Norwegian government had decided that they would demolish. Well, to give you some good news, recently some Amer a big American firm has come forward and said, we will help you fix this building because there is a tunnel underneath the building. And they think that other bomb, bombs can come there and that they would also destroy and, and, and so on. We will help you repair and keep this building safe. So hopefully we will continue to have this beautiful thing outside and inside. Okay, now continue. Now, how did they communicate? Carl wrote to Picasso about the work. He went to Picasso, he showed him how the things worked. Here he's showing him how the, the mask and so on. Stop for a while. And the relationship worked that way with regard to the three-dimensional sculptures. The, contract was different. What they did was that after all of this came out, and then Barcelona, the big, big, big outdoor uh, things in Barcelona came out, 
Everybody wanted a Picasso, and everybody sort of thought, how do we get them? So they all had to, got in touch with Carl. So as soon as Carl caught, got a letter from somebody or some uh, suggesting that they get a uh, Picasso, Carl would have to go to Picasso. But Carl, first of all, had to get the photographs of where they would be, uh, the, uh, all about the, 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 uh, the, what, what they wanted and how tall th the things wanted. This is now for the three-dimensional. And then Carl would assemble all of this stuff and go to Picasso and then put this project to him. How do you feel about that? Oh, because if Picasso liked it, then they would do, uh, they would, he would give him a model, for example, and so on. Now, Picasso would not let the models go. So Carl had to make copies of the model by photographing, by uh, actually doing um, uh, tracings, and uh, uh, so on, and um, measuring. So he'd go back to Oslo, make his, mo uh, his uh, copies of, uh, of the models, and then would sort of make a photo montage, which means that he would put this sort of in the grass, and then blow up the picture to show, and then show Picasso what it would be like, and then would bring in photographs of this place, etc., cetera, et cetera, and then that's how they work, work, work out. Now, the first one again, the one of, um, no, that's one, uh, the, the, Yes, the one of a lady with, um, with <laughs> you can go back. <laughs> yeah, go yeah, back. We, we need to, we need to <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, I won't be too long. Yeah. Okay, back one more. Yeah, uh, one more, two more. Two more. <laughs> yes, so here, this one. So this, for example, as, as I told you, had, if Picasso wasn't happy, it would be destroyed. That was the same now thing. If Picasso wasn't happy uh, with the thing, it would be destroyed. With the new projects now, Picasso, for example, had to be convinced sometimes. So, so if he wasn't happy with the design Carl brought up or so on, then if the major changes had to be made, the Carl had to go back to to, to, to step one again, and then go back. He was very, 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 very strict with everything. And also he had a good head for, for dimension. He, of course he was an artist, he was, a, uh, he was a, a genius. But, so that's what happened also with the rest of them. So he would then get an okay before, and then with a signature of, from Picasso, and then he would proceed with the project. And, 33 projects were finished, completed. Um, the highest is in Christina Ham, which is 15 meters high. And we celebrated her 50th birthday this year, in the summer, right after Carl died. Incidentally, Carl died in May. And so we were there, and Diana was there and celebrating with us. And it was so interesting to see all the folkish thing that these Swedes did. And uh, at that time, for example, after, uh, the sculpture was uh, dedicated, uh, made in uh, Christina Ham. Picasso got a gift of a, of a native costume from Sweden, which he sometimes wore, and, <laughs> and so on. So if you go back to a couple more. Oh, okay, a little bit more, the last one with Jacqueline. So now, not only did this re did, uh, uh, come into a beautiful, beautiful working relationship, because they were always, con they were always communicating letters, uh, letters, cards, telegrams, pictures. All the pictures would be sent to Picasso. And then they became friends. And sometimes, for example, other friends would go. The, the engineers would sometimes go. The, the people, Picasso loved to meet some of the workers. Carl took the workers down to Picasso. And he, Picasso, for example, would have, t Carl kept, took pictures of some of the stuff and the workers themselves, and Picasso would dedicate these to, to the workers themselves, the Spanish workers and the Norwegian workers, which is pour mon ami, et cetera. So that was, and then, that, for example, Jacqueline allowed Carl to photograph her. Next. And then, of course, he allowed him to be photographed <laughs> in the garden. <laughs> And then in, they also, in 1964, yes, 1964, his fa Carl's family was there and he taught his young daughter to swim. <laughs> yes? <laughs> and then I just want to tell you the last thing. Up to the last day, Picasso died. They, they, Carl was there actually to meet him. And they had plans to continue their work. 
This is the, the, the lady with a hat, the femme au, au chapeau, yes? And Picasso had this idea that he would have this sculpture as a facade of a building. There'd be a, a building behind it, and this would be the facade, you know, that would be hanging out. And then people would live behind the eyes, be behind the ears, behind the breasts. Yeah, wouldn't that be wonderful? It'd be lovely to be live behind the eyes. And that's how the relationship was with Carl Petnechar and Pablo Picasso. Up to the day he died, Carl remembered. And as I said, he, because he was, it was most, some of the most happiest days of his life with Picasso. It was interesting. And one thing that he mostly admired about Picasso, which also I find now with Tiola, which is very interesting, he considered him a friend and a source of inspiration. Picasso was fun to be with. What Neshar liked about Picasso was his frankness, his way of saying things simply and concisely. Neshar found Picasso, despite his fame, modest and totally unassuming. His commitment, his, uh, commitment uh, and profound interest and confidence in his own work and the work of other artists impressed Carl. Picasso, on giving Neshar the first drawings for Oslo, said, here, take the drawings, take them, and do the project. You can do it. Thank you. Thank you, Silva. Uh, merci beaucoup, Silvia, pour ce beau témoignage. Euh, qui euh, nous rappelle non seulement la, la durée euh, et l'ampleur de la collaboration de Picasso avec euh, Karl Nejar, mais aussi euh, l'amitié euh, qui liait les deux, euh, les deux artistes. Je propose que nous euh, nous enchaînions avec euh, la communication de Catherine Kraft et que nous reportions donc la séance de questions-réponses en fin, de, en fin de, de séance. Donc Catherine Kraft, vous êtes docteur en histoire de l'art, diplômée de l'université de Virginie, curator au Nasher Sculpture Center et spécialiste des courants Dada, Néo-Dada et de l'expressionnisme abstrait. Vous allez aujourd'hui étudier la tête de femme, érigée initialement en béton à Larvik dans la propriété de l'architecte Erling Vickshaw approuvé par Picasso et qui a ensuite rejoint les collections du Nasher Sculpture Center. Thank you very much, Cecile, and thank you to uh, everyone here at the museum for organizing first a wonderful exhibition and also these uh, wonderful days of, of scholarship. Um, the Raymond and Patsy Nasher collection in Dallas contains over 300 works of modern and contemporary sculpture, including seven by Picasso, one of which you heard about quite extensively this morning, uh, another of which is the monumental 1958 Head of a Woman. Raymond Nasher purchased the work at auction in 2001, and it's been on display in the garden of the Nasher Sculpture Center since the museum opened in 2003. The origins of the Nasher sculpture lie, as you just heard, in a visit made to Picasso early in 1957 by Carl Nassiar. And uh, I planned for the beginning of my talk to rehearse this uh, first encounter a little bit, but there's no way I can tell it as successfully and entertainingly as uh, Sylvia just has. So I will go somewhat quickly through, through these images where you see the print uh, for the Actuel Kunst Society that uh, Carl uh, asked for from uh, Picasso um, and the introduction uh, to Picasso of uh, informing him about the Betograv technique um, in which forms uh, packed tightly with gravel aggregate are filled with concrete and upon drying the concrete surface can be sandblasted to reveal the underlying aggregate. The artistic possibilities are considerable as the sandblasting can range from large areas to narrow lines. Picasso was intrigued and so uh, eventually allowed uh, Nassiar to use the Betograv technique, as we've heard and seen, to make engraved drawings based on his work on the walls of the Oslo government building. Um, Picasso's enthusiastic response led Nassiar to make another proposal to use the Betograv technique to create a large sculpture by Picasso in the garden of Vixio's summer home outside Larvik, Norway. If the results failed to satisfy Picasso, the sculpture could be destroyed. 
The outcome, which you see here, was the 10-foot high head of a woman. Nessiar's photos of it so pleased Picasso that the sculpture became the first of 15 monumental Betograv sculptures by Picasso in collaboration with Nessiar, in addition to more wall engravings. Head of a Woman was to spend the next uh, almost four decades in Vixio's garden, and considering all the years it's been outdoors and the disparate climates of Norway and Texas, uh, the Head of a Woman has aged fairly well. Four years ago it underwent conservation, uh, concrete is porous, and the metal armature inside the sculpture uh, began to rust and swell, causing the concrete and gravel to be pushed out at one small place in particular. Uh, fortunately, our conservator was able to um, excavate into the sculpture, stop the rusting, and put the sculptures that popped off uh, back into place. Picasso never saw the head of a woman, uh, nor any of the later Betograv sculptures. From the beginning, his collaboration with Nessiar was negotiated through photographs, letters, and conversations uh, during Nessiar's frequent visits to the south of France. The source for Head of a Woman was identified by Werner Spies as a steel maquette. In 1997, Ray Nasher acquired this painted steel sculpture, Head of a Woman, also called Head of Jacqueline, which provides a close match, especially on the proper left side. Since Betograv was initially used on the flat surfaces of walls, it was logical that one of Picasso's planar sculptures was selected as the starting point for the sculptural experiment, since these sculptures shared with the Norwegian technique a creative combination of material, line, and flat image. In the sheet metal sculptures, Picasso used planar surfaces to generate works confounding expectations of the continuous three-dimensional contours typical of much sculpture. Head of a Woman presents sharply delineated glimpses of individual forms and makes us aware of how readily we read a simple circle, for example, as an eye, but how quickly a glance at the same work from a different angle can reconfigure that initial impression of eye into ear. The Nasher's 1957 Head of a Woman is one of a group of five sculptures made that year featuring a woman's head atop a long slender pole. Rather than being folded, as in the silvette heads that preceded them, or folded and punctuated with cutout plays of positive and negative space, as in the sheet metal sculptures that would follow, the 1957 heads featured discrete planes slotted into place atop a vertical cylinder, or in the case of the one on the left, one of uh, Tiola's uh, angular metal tubes. The Nasher's head may be one of the last of this group, as David Douglas Duncan's photographs of Picasso painting it reveal glimpses of three other heads at the left and lower left. And there's two of, there's two of them and one up there. Mm. Uh, da, da, da. Um, as many observers have noted, with their staring gazes and disembodied heads poised like trophies atop poles, these works have a strongly totemic character. Moreover, the motif of a head poised atop a long, thin neck has its own place in Picasso's work. It appears in contemporary sculptures, as you see here, including the painting that Picasso uh, provided as a, as a source for the print of, for the Actual Kunst Society. Um, and here in this photo, two years later, with all five heads, the fifth one is hard to see, but it's hiding right over there in that corner. Um, this, and as Elizabeth Cowling has pointed out, um, this motif, the woman with the long neck, uh, has a history and it has predecessors. Um, the pole sculpture's affinity with these earlier works provides another possible reason that head of a woman was selected for enlargement. The 1928 head uh, here, second from the left, is associated with Picasso's work on the Apollinaire Monument and a painting of the next year merges a ferocious head with a gray monolith with tiny figures creating an impression of enormous scale. The parallels with these works heighten when we consider other photographs of the same shoot by Duncan, namely Picasso's creation of a mise-en-scene for a closely related pole sculpture in the Musée Picasso um, and in the current exhibition with cutout figures, a feather duster palm tree, and a sketched backdrop transforming the sculpture into a veritable maquette for an enlarged monumental piece, um, in this case described by Picasso to Duncan as a, a sort of house rather than uh, a monument. And right there, 
right there you see a, a little staircase leading up to the, the tower. Um, <clears throat> the atavistic character of the pole sculptures lend them an intensity in the, uh, belying their modest size. And it's interesting to note that Picasso's forays into monumental works included attempts to render all the pole sculptures at larger sizes. Um, in 1965, as Sylvia noted, Nesjar succeeded in executing a mon monumental version of this head in Sweden, and he likewise secured Picasso's approval for Betograv versions of two of the other heads, although neither project went forward. Picasso made the pole sculptures uh, by having forms cut from templates. The components of these two heads, for example, were fabricated from the same cardboard maquette. And the same is true of the Nasher's head of a woman and the Musée Picasso's wooden head, uh, which is on display upstairs, uh, and for, which is also on display at uh, the common maquette for both of them. Disassembled, uh, the maquette shows three components and the two parts of the head, I'm showing you just the front and the back of the same component. Um, all three components fit into, whoops, sorry, slits cut in the top of the tube. In assembly, the trapezoidal shape is placed squarely straight onto the pole, and the profile face is perpendicular to it with the back of the head and the sort of chignon or ponytail slotting on at an angle. Despite their structural similarities, the two heads are painted very differently from each other and from the maquette. In the Maisé Picasso's wooden head, the proper left side of the sculpture is a simple black silhouette, recalling Picasso's inclusion of many such profiles in his two-dimensional works. On the proper right, a great staring eye gazes out at the viewer, but as we move around the piece, or as in the current exhibition as it moves around for us, um, a second frontally oriented eye quickly comes into view. And in addition to the profile, we're confronted with the gaze of a sort of skull. And what I'm calling the front and the back of the sculptures reconfigure into um, additional schematic profiles. So, In the Nasher sculpture, Picasso becomes more elaborate with the proper left side spreading a combined profile and fully frontal face across the abutting sheets. The result overall is a series of often contradictory views that nonetheless seem to evoke a single head, with the back of the sculpture conflating rear of the head in profile, hair pulled back, and both ears improbably occupying the same plane. The virtuoso left profile contrasts strongly with the more perfunctory, even childlike rendering of the right profile a dichotomy Picasso previously used in this head of Sylvet. If I've spent some time comparing the two 1957 heads, it's to allow me to present a conundrum concerning the Betograv head of a woman. As we've seen, the proper left similarity to the Nasher's steel head suggests that it was the source for the Betograv piece, and likewise the front view. But there are crucial differences that point to the Musée Picasso head as the source, and it's acknowledged as such um, in the current exhibition and catalog. Um, but for example, uh, the way the pole is striped in the Betograv piece is much closer to the Musée Picasso's uh, pole, striped pole. And if we move around to the proper right side, it matches the Musée Picasso's right side and its staring skull. There are furthermore uh, qualities unique to the Betograv head. The back view, a contrast of smooth concrete and mostly exposed gravel, is shared with neither of the smaller sculptures. Also, as you can see, the planes of the head meet in the concrete version at right angles, whereas in the smaller versions, the back plane is set at an angle to the trapezoidal plane. Moving the plane to a 90 degree position would have likely simplified construction of the sculpture and Nessiar sandblasting of the requisite areas. The larger question is, how did Nessiar arrive at the final form of the Betograv head of a woman? In projects that follow, Nessiar worked from photographs of Picasso's sculptures, as Picasso did not want him to take these works from the studio. As we've seen, Nessiar would then use photographs and those of the prospective site to create a photo montage showing the small work scaled up for Picasso to approve, usually with a signature and date. 
Nessier would base his fabrication on photographs and measurements of the maquette made during visits to Picasso, then send Picasso photos of the resu resulting sculpture for his final approval, or take them to him in person. Although he showed Picasso photographs of the completed Betograph head of a woman, it's not clear how they proceeded initially, especially in combining planes from two different sculptures. Nessier unquestionably used the more striking of the profile views from each of the smaller sculptures. But whose decision was this? Did he and Picasso discuss making a large sculpture that would combine the strongest aspects of both pieces? Or did Nessier himself combine them, taking advantage of the experimental status of the project, um, somewhat as we saw with, with the way he changed um, the execution of the faun and the centaur, the wall in Oslo? A final possibility, which I think is very unlikely, but I have to I'll just put it out there. Um, it's been surprising to me um, to see in the literature how seldom the two smaller heads are distinguished um, in literature on these works and how little attention has been given to variations between the two of them and the Betograph head. It's possible, although I think it's very unlikely given how careful Nessiar was in every other um, project that I, I know of him. Um, but it, there's a slight possibility that perhaps working from photographs, Nessiar chose aspects from two different sculptures without realizing it. Discrepancies among these versions of Head of a Woman have been largely overlooked, and this is, to my knowledge, the first attempt to document them, and so my paper is very much a work in progress, as I've yet to exhaust archival sources for evidence of Nessiar's and Picasso's decisions regarding the work's fabrication. The Betograph sculptures have received less attention than other aspects of Picasso's sculptural oeuvre, but even my preliminary investigations suggest how much there is to be learned from them about the nature of Picasso's and Nessiar's collaboration, which exceeds a straightforward enlarged replication of a pre-existing original. There's also much to be learned from them about the sculptural complexity and playfulness that Picasso brought to bear in his planar sculptures and their unfolding complicated views. Thanks very much. Catherine? Um, this was the first round sculpture, and they right. were experimenting. Right. Yeah. And so they, they, nobody knew how it was going to turn out. Right. And, uh, and that was the, the miracle of it all. Mm -hmm. it, it, did, it did turn out, and because it was satisfied, and they kept yes. it, yes. Right. So and that was because it was, nobody knew, that nobody had done. Mm -hmm. And that's why also Picasso decided to have it only three meters high mm -hmm. and not taller, because they, no, they, they were uncertain. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Merci Sylvia, merci beaucoup Catherine pour cet exposé très précis sur la tête de femme aujourd'hui conservé euh, au Nashers Culture Center euh, qui euh, pose de nombreuses questions euh, autour euh, de euh, ce, ce grand sujet qui est celui de, de la collaboration mais aussi de la délégation euh, d'une œuvre d'art et euh, avec les, les questions donc, de, de format, euh, d'insertion dans un, dans un espace naturel ou euh, urbain de, de la sculpture telle que qu'imaginée à distance euh, par, euh, par Picasso. Euh, cela pose aussi euh, des questions euh, d'ordre, euh, comme vous l'avez montré, euh, d'ordre euh, scénographique, on pourrait presque dire euh, scénique, euh, de, euh, de la sculpture, que nous pourrons peut-être aborder euh, donc, euh, en, fin de, en fin de séance. Euh, je merci encore et euh, je donne la parole maintenant à Anna Rossellini, vous êtes docteur en histoire de l'architecture à l'école polytechnique de Lausanne, chercheur à l'université de Bologne et professeur invité à l'école d'architecture de Marne-la-Vallée. Vous êtes une grande spécialiste du béton en architecture et vous avez publié un ouvrage dédié à Le Corbusier et notamment à cette, cette pratique et cette utilisation du béton et euh, également un ouvrage sur Louis Kahn euh, et également donc sur cette question du béton en architecture. Nous vous écoutons. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup Cécile pour votre présentation et merci, moi aussi je vous remercie vous et et aussi Virginie pour avoir organisé les différentes journées du colloque et aussi pour m'avoir invitée, même si je ne suis pas un spécialiste de la sculpture de, de Picasso. 
Donc, euh, j'ai légèrement changé euh, les titres. Euh, Qu'est-ce que je dois faire Parce que je ne les vois pas. Si, non, peut-être ça va apparaître. Oui. Non. <rire> Désolée. <rire> Voilà, c'est parfait. Donc, j'étais en train de dire que j'ai légèrement changé les titres de, de ma communication d'aujourd'hui parce que, en fait, les points de départ de mes recherches est l'architecture. Et donc, j'ai décidé de consacrer une bonne partie de, de ma communication à l'architecture, donc à l'utilisation du béton, pas simplement par Picasso et Nejar, mais aussi en architecture. Euh, depuis le début des années 30, Picasso commence à expérimenter une sorte de sculpture créée en plâtre ou en argile et puis collée en bronze qui combine les modèles traditionnels de la matière faits avec les mains ou les outils avec la création d'empreintes réelles produites sur les plâtres par des matériaux et d'objets. Ce genre de sculpture révèle le rôle fondamental des empreintes dans des sculptures faites avec un unique matériau. Picasso opère une transformation radicale du concept du mule qui est démoulage d'une forme conçue indépendamment du processus technique, finit par prendre son propre rôle dans la sculpture. Euh, la d'utilité de, de la matière d'origine de la sculpture en bronze, les plâtres, devient l'aspect technique expérimenté par Picasso. Il est grâce à l'impression dans les plâtres d'un matériau ou d'un objet qui des textures surprenantes et inattendues nées dans les sculptures en bronze. Les empreintes de divers matériaux commencent à apparaître dans, dans les œuvres de Picasso dans les années 30, euh, lorsqu'il modèle les plâtres avec du papier froissé, du carton ondulé, des morceaux de métal, des sphères ou des planches en bois. Et depuis le début des années 40, les sculptures en bronze de Picasso prennent la forme d'assemblage de morceaux qui de plus en plus transforme les modélés avec différentes empreintes dans un vrai bricolage qui cependant est fusionné dans un seul matériau. Une rencontre entre Picasso et les Corbusier se révèle cruciale pour les deux artistes. En août 1949, Picasso se tourne vers José Luis Sert pour avoir l'opportunité de visiter les chantiers de la construction de l'unité d'habitation de Le Corbusier à Marseille. Picasso et Le Corbusier, pour arriver à Marseille, voyagent ensemble dans une voiture qui sera l'objet d'une caricature du genre cadavereski que vous voyez dans, dans l'image. Et la série de photographies euh, documente les, les moments saillants de la, de la visite de, de, de Picasso. Malheureusement, il n'y a pas de documents suggérant les, les mots prononcés par Picasso ou le Corbusier euh, lors de leur rencontre. Une rencontre qui a lieu dans le chantier qui sera destiné à marquer l'affirmation dans, dans le monde de l'esthétique du béton brut. Picasso ne peut qu'admirer le potentiel artistique du béton apparent de l'œuvre de Le Corbusier, y compris les, les imperfections du coulage et son exécution brutale. Seulement c'est lui qui, comme Picasso, s'est immergé dans l'univers des empreintes laissées par des matériaux rigides sur des substances mous qui se solidifient, sans se soucier de les composer dans un dessin parfait, peut être capable de saisir la révélation de Marseille, cette découverte inattendue d'une étonnante beauté des malfaçons que les ingénieurs et les ouvriers de Le Corbusier ont cependant cherché à réduire au minimum pendant toutes les phases de la construction. On pourrait aussi supposer que Picasso était à l'origine de l'intuition de Le Corbusier d'écrire l'éloge de la malfaçon, malfaçon comme très distinctif du béton brut de Marseille, et même de la définition des brutes comme corollaire de la technique de construction du concept d'empreinte sculpturale. Suite à la visite de l'unité d'habitation, Picasso dessine des architectures fantastiques et colossales, comme celui qu'il a visité à Marseille, et souvent surélevé du sol grâce aux pilotis en forme. Et ce qui doit avoir frappé Picasso de cette œuvre de Le Corbusier est le potentiel de plasticité des surfaces en béton armé. Donc la possibilité de les plier comme dans les pilotis, dans les cheminées ou dans le vent de l'unité d'habitation. 
Les architectures dessinées par Picasso semblent être conçues avec du carton ou de la tôle et sont caractérisées par des plis comme ceux que le Corbusier lui-même réalise avec la chapelle de Ronchamp ou les pavillons euh, Philips. En 1952, Picasso demande à Le Corbusier de faire une autre visite à l'unité d'habitation, ce qui démontre comme cette œuvre l'a impressionné. Et précisément dans les années après la visite à Marseille, les expériences menées par Picasso sur les empreintes des objets dans les plâtres sont enrichies par des variantes qui prévoient également d'inclure l'utilisation des planches en bois non rabotées et avec des veines de, de, de bois visibles, comme dans la sculpture en bronze tête de 1958. Finalement, les bronzes de Picasso et les bétons bruts de Le Corbusier se ressemblent. Et lorsque Le Corbusier, en 1953, à la fin de la construction de l'unité d'habitation, fait la comparaison entre les bétons et les bronzes, parce que les deux matériaux sont capables de révéler dans la transition de l'état liquide à l'état solide toutes les empreintes et les textures du mule, il semble penser aux sculptures de Picasso. Aux yeux de Le Corbusier, les coffrages euh, deviennent une grande moule et l'unité d'habitation est générée par un processus artistique identique à ceux d'une grande sculpture en bronze coulé. Euh, après... La visite à, pardon, après la visite à Marseille, Picasso commence aussi à inclure les bétons armés parmi les, les matériaux de ses sculptures, qui deviennent des grandioses coques diversement pliées, sur lesquelles ils sont gravés des signes qui transforment les coques en figures, selon une technique spéciale appel, appelée bétogravure et mise à point, comme on a dit par euh, Karl Nejar. Cette technique est basée sur l'élimination de la peau du béton qui se forme par capillarité en contact avec les coffrages, au moyen d'un outil à l'air comprimé, de manière à révéler les agrégats constituant les, les bétons. La définition utilisée par Nejar et Picasso pour indiquer les surfaces résultant de la technique d'exportation est béton soufflé. Ainsi, les granulats sont choisis en fonction de leur couleur, de façon à obtenir des contrastes visibles entre les surfaces issues du béton et les bétons soufflés. Précisément à cause du fait que la technique de Nejar implique la gravure de la surface pour créer des lignes et des surfaces contrastées, on peut la faire remonter directement aux graffitos décrits et pratiqués par Giorgio Vasari, mais aussi par les Corbusier dans, les, dans, dans sa première architecture qu'il construit à la Chaux-des-Fonds, la, la Villa Fallée. Bien sûr, Nejar a développé différents procédés pour son type spécial de sgraffito. Dans certaines sculptures, les sculptures qu'on voit dans la partie supérieure de la diapositive, il intervient sur les coffrages en bois en les travaillant selon les types de surfaces obtenues une fois la sculpture en béton terminée. Il applique ensuite des feuilles en plastique pour obtenir des surfaces lisses de façon à distinguer déjà dans la phase de décoffrage les secteurs à travailler qui donnent les bétons soufflés et ceux qui ne doivent pas être travaillés. Dans d'autres cas, qu'on voit dans la partie inférieure de la, de la diapositive, il intervient directement sur la surface du béton après le décoffrage sans que le coffrage soit travaillé. La technique du bétogravure doit également être considérée dans le contexte des différentes techniques qui se multiplient après la Deuxième Guerre mondiale, après l'invention du, du béton brut, et donc de l'univers des textures pour les surfaces du béton apparent que la façon de mettre en œuvre ces matériaux a ouvert avec l'unité d'habitation à, à Marseille. De nombreux architectes, contrairement à Le Corbusier, décident de travailler le béton après le décoffrage pour obtenir des effets spéciaux qui vont au-delà de celles des simples empreintes des décoffrages et permettent de faire ressortir les agrégats du mélange du, du, du béton qui sont donc choisis, pas simplement pour leurs propriétés mécaniques, mais aussi pour leur qualité esthétique, donc les qualités des couleurs et des, des textures. Pour exposer les agrégats, euh, sont utilisés des processus qui, qui vont euh, du bouchardage au, sa, au sablage des, des surfaces qui est effectué après le décoffrage. Et Carlos Carpa et Marcel Breuer deviennent les majeurs promoteurs du bouchardage, utilisé aussi par Auguste Perret depuis les années 30, et qui sera ensuite diversement réinterprété par Yeo Ming euh, Pei. 
D'autres types spéciales de béton sont les Desert Concrete, inventés par Franklin Wright pour les pavillons de Thalesin West, réalisés avec des pierres placées contre les coffrages et du béton très sèche coulé, et la maçonnerie en béton réalisée par Erosa Rinen pour les collèges Samuel F. B. Morse et Edza Style, où le béton est appliqué sous pression entre les, les, les pierres déjà placées dans, dans les coffrages. Dans le cas de la technique de Sarine, il faut intervenir après le décoffrage avec des ciseaux, des, des, des brosses, des jets d'eau à haute pression pour enlever la peau euh, du béton de la surface. La technique de Sarine rentre dans celle du rubble concrete, du prepaked concrete, qui, au moins depuis les années 30, ont été utilisées pour consolider les fondations des grands travaux publics. On disposait des de pierres et, et du gravier puis on a jeté sous pression les mélanges du, du béton. Les desert concrete et les rubble concrete, et aussi les prepaked concrete, rentrent dans les genres connus dans les années 60 comme pre-placed aggregate concrete, dans lesquels le nature béton, la technique par laquelle les bétogravures de Nejar naît, est également inclus. Précisément au fin eh, d'obtenir des effets de surface recherchés, L'architecte norvégienne Vixio, on a déjà, du, duquel on a déjà parlé, qui est l'inventeur du nature béton, perfectionne une sorte de mise en œuvre du, du béton pour avoir des couches superficielles, dans les couches superficielles, un pourcentage considérable d'agrégats. Il faut cependant souligner, pour éviter de croire que les inventions datant des années 60 soient les premières, que depuis la, la première, les premières décennies du XXe siècle, des ingénieurs, et des, des entrepreneurs et des inventeurs ont créé des dispositifs qui euh, prévoient l'utilisation d'un tel type d'utilisation du béton, comme ce que vous voyez dans l'image ici, dans la diapositive. C'est dans le cadre de cette technique spéciale conçue pour faire rassembler les bétons à la pierre que Vixio découvre son système et il dépose un brevet dont vous voyez un dessin dans, dans la diapositive. Le processus est assez semblable au prepaked pre concrete utilisé par Sarinen. Le mélange est injecté sous pression dans les coffrages dans lesquels les agrégats sont déjà placés et après le décoffrage, les surfaces sont sablées avec des machines à l'air comprimé. Autour de même année où Vixio perfectionne son système, aussi d'autres spécialistes du béton comme James M. Silson inventent une technique similaire qu'il appelle « arbeton ». Et il y aura aussi un conflit juridique entre les titulaires du brevet de la, du Nature Beton, donc Vixio, et ceux de l'Arbeton. L'Arbeton sera utilisé par exemple par les sommes pour la mise en œuvre du béton du One May Place à Dallas de 1967. À côté de Louis Kahn, Paul Rudolph, Breuer et Sarinen, l'une des protagonistes de l'Architectural Concrete, c'est-à-dire une sorte de béton qui doit avoir un travail parfait de la surface, et paye. Ces recherches sur les qualités formelles du béton commencent au milieu des années 50 et se poursuivra sans interruption au, moyen, au moins jusqu'aux années 70. Dans la série des, des premiers bâtiments de pays en béton armé apparent, rentrent aussi les complexes des trois tours résidentielles, la University Plaza dans la New York University, construite en 1960, entre les 1960 et les 1966, et pour l'aménagement du jardin entre les tours, Pei fait appel à Picasso, qui avec Nejar réalise les boosts des euh, sylvettes, fait avec du béton brun clair, de la même couleur du béton des tours de, de Pei. La, la sculpture a été réalisée en 1968. La connaissance des pays de la technique sculpturale de Nejar et Picasso remonte en 1958, lorsque Pei rencontre à Paris Nejar, qui rentre en, Norge, en Norvège depuis le sud de la, de la France, où il a discuté avec Picasso de sa technique de bétogravure. Et le bus des de, de Sylvettes est une œuvre sculpturale qui ne se limite pas seulement à montrer les potentiels créatifs de bétogravure, mais il est également un petit morceau de virtuosité de l'ingénierie liée à la technique du béton armé précontrante. En fait, on ne peut pas oublier les rôles joués dans la construction par Weisskopf et Pitchworth, l'entreprise d'ingénierie de New York consultée pour résoudre l'équilibre des surfaces en béton armé soumis à la pression du vent, 
puisque euh, ces surfaces agissent comme les voiles d'un bateau. La stabilité est donc assurée grâce à euh, une large base liée avec les colonnes qui sont disposées dans les garages euh, souterrains. Et sur cette base sont fixés les câbles pour les précontraintes qui euh, traversent les voiles en béton de la, de la sculpture. Pei euh, n'est pas un, euh, indifférent à la technique de Nejar et Picasso, dans laquelle il voit la possibilité de sculpter des, des, des surfaces en béton et de les caractériser avec des rainures autres que celles rendues célèbres par Paul Rudolph dans l'Art and Architecture Building à New Haven. Et les travaux du béton armé de Pei sont enrichis avec les textures inhabituelles grâce à l'application euh, originale du bétogravure. Et c'est dans les deux ouvrages que vous voyez eh, dans la diapositive que Pei commence à expérimenter une nouvelle façon de mettre en œuvre, d'utiliser la technique du bétogravure eh, inventée par euh, Nejar. Si l'on considère la relation entre Picasso et les Corbusier à partir du béton brut de Marseille jusqu'aux techniques pour la sculpture de, de Nejar et Picasso et ensuite aussi les influences de ces techniques sur les chantiers de la construction, on peut constater comme la matière et la technique du béton ont rendu similaire l'architecture et la sculpture des années 50 et 60 sans que leur propre spécificité soit confondue. On pourrait parler d'une synthèse des arts à vocation technique. Merci. Merci beaucoup, Anna, pour cette très, très belle présentation qui nous a permis donc de recontextualiser les sculptures en bétogravure de Picasso et Karl Nejar dans l'histoire de l'architecture, donc du béton brut, comme vous l'avez bien bien énoncé, euh, jusqu'aux jusqu architectures, euh, jusqu'au béton de construction. Euh, et ce qui permet, après donc, cette table ronde que nous avons eue en début d'après-midi, euh, dédiée à la question de la sculpture peinture, euh, d'aborder cette question de la, la sculpture architecture, ou architecture sculpture, dans cette idée, en effet, de euh, synthèse des arts. Merci beaucoup. Alors, je me tourne tout de suite vers euh, l'audience. Est-ce qu'il euh, est qu y a des questions dans la salle à l'une de nos trois intervenantes Oui. D'accord. Vous avez un petit témoignage, c'est vrai De François Gillot. <rire> Et pour moi, c'est très intéressant parce qu'en fait... Euh, avant, j'avais fait que des recherches à la Fondation Le Corbusier. J'avais euh, trouvé tout les, la, 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 campagne, la campagne photographique dédiée à la visite de Picasso, qui pour Le Corbusier, c'est un moment très spécial. Il y a, pas, euh, il y a beaucoup de photos et ce n'est pas normal. Normalement, Le Corbusier ne fait pas réaliser euh, beaucoup de photos pour les visites de, 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 de ses collègues ou ses amis. Et, et en fait, au début, aussi les chercheurs et moi aussi, je m'étais trompée parce qu'on savait que Picasso était allé à visiter l'unité d'habitation à Marseille en 1952, et, mais on ne savait pas de la, de la première visite de 1949. Et c'est grâce à, à, aux archives du, du musée Picasso que j'ai redécouvert la lettre que le Corbusier écrit à, à Picasso, dans laquelle il dit que certes, il veut, qui certes lui a dit qu'il veut aller à visiter l'unité d'habitation. Et c'est le seul témoignage que j'ai pu voir. Donc, pour moi, volontiers. <rire> Elle est présente d'ailleurs sur les photographies euh, qui sont oui. conservées aux archives. Oui, Encore si aussi. vous avez des documents, des témoignages, pour moi, ça serait très intéressant. C'était fascinant, j'ai beaucoup apprécié. Merci, Merci beaucoup. D'autres questions ou remarques je, donc, euh... je crois que Picasso avait demandé à Karl Nejar combien d'années est-ce que ces, ces sculptures pourraient survivre D'après mes souvenirs, il avait demandé à Karl Nejar. Euh, C'est pour vous aussi. Donc, euh, Picasso, Picasso uh, told uh, to uh, ask to Nejar mm. how many years uh, will last. Uh, yes, uh, yes. He, Picasso was very preoccupied with uh, how long the sculptures would last. 
And uh, Carl said to him, well, you know, according to our engineers, it will be oh, like 2,000 years because the Romans had invented cement. So, I mean, according to that, and Carl said, d'accord. <laughs> and that was just fine. But speaking of, of going to Courboisier, Carl has told me the story. Also, Picasso was very interested in having a, a, a group of Picasso sculptures along the, uh, the coast at Nice. And he said to Carl, why don't you go to the mayor? And because I can't go to the mayor, I'm the artist, you know. Yeah. Why don't you go to the mayor and ask him if that would be possible? And so he went, Carl went actually to the mayor of, of Nice and said, you know, this is a proposition well, from the greatest artist in the world. I mean, and you know, he's a neighbor. No, he didn't, it was the expense. It was the same with Oslo. Picasso was very interested, and Carl was very interested in having a sculpture in, in a, a, a three-dimensional sculpture in Oslo. But when Carl approached the city, they said no twice. And Olarvik also said no twice. So, and then, for example, the, the, big, the, the big bather, which was in Chicago, it was intended for the museum at, at, at Copenhagen, you know, outside of Copenhagen. And what happened is that the Everything was in, in order, everything was planned, and then Carlsberg had a strike. Because they were actually the ones who were funding the Picasso sculpture. And when the strike was over, they had no more money. That was that, shot, gone, gone away, no more. <laughs> so it was just a lot of stuff like that that happened, you know even though there were other, I mean, there was the, the one that was intended for also for, for Florida, for Southern Florida. That also went down the, the, the drain. I mean, it was just so many. But all artists know that, I mean, not everything that they do or plan comes to fruition. So it's, it's just very natural. And they both accepted it. It was just fine. But they had lots of plans. There's a letter from Carl, I think from 1967, where he outlines, I think, six or seven projects with little sketches and so on, and they want this and they want that and so on. You know, it was, it was, it was tremendous. It was tremendous. Yeah. And that he trusted, that Picasso trusted Carl so well, that was, I think, I think and that was that he went by instinct from that thing that uh, Dierichs, you know, his first Norwegian friend, and then comes another one here. I mean, he was that, that kind of a person. That's what, what Carl thought in any case. You know, he was, um, yeah. So. Merci Sylvia. Mm -hmm. Merci. Donc euh, Alain mm -hmm. Kirilli ou Jean-Louis Andral. Euh, ah, mais. Utilisez le terme béton gravure. Quand vous utilisez le terme béton gravure, nous savons l'outil qu'utilisait euh, Karl, mais lorsqu'on voit ces lignes dans euh, le béton de euh, Paye, oui, euh, là on utilise un autre outil, non? C'est alors là, il y a deux, euh, deux outils. Il y a un outil à la main, euh, qui est en sorte de... Euh, L'outil qui fait les bouchardages, je ne sais pas comment ça s'appelle en français. Un sorte de ciseau qui fait des lignes, donc c'est à la main. Mais il y a aussi une sorte d'outil mécanique qui reproduit les mêmes effets de bouchardage avec la mécanisation. Donc, mais ce n'est pas, pas les mêmes outils. Mais c'est vrai que euh, lorsque euh, Paye regarde la technique de Nejar, il a cette, euh, volonté, mm. cette, cette euh, oui, volonté de commencer à travailler la surface. Parce qu'avant, il, il, euh, il travaillait beaucoup sur les mélanges. Donc, il étudiait soigneusement les mélanges, les types de couleurs, les types d'agrégats à introduire. Il faisait aussi des recettes du béton, mais il ne travaillait pas la surface, sinon avec des, des, des lavages. Mmh. Euh, mais lorsqu'il commence à venir en contact avec euh, Nejar, alors lui aussi, il commence à dessiner, mmh. si on veut, les, mmh. les surfaces avec des rainures. Yeah, I'd like to add something to that. When you, I showed you the outer walls of the government building, Those walls were made in bits and pieces in a factory where there was actually a mechanical sandblaster that did those. And that was the architect that designed those. And then they just came piece, piece by piece and went up 18 floors. That's, that was. Also, some of the pillars in the government building were done that way, automatically or, or mechanically. 
So that was because uh, Wikscher had and, uh, and his uh, engineer had worked in a lot of buildings in Oslo beforehand, just that way, mechanically. The art part came after the artist came into the picture. And then that's what it became. And then Wikscher designed that building like a handmade like a, 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 a building, it was all, all like the teak in it, the 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 floor, the floors, the elevator, all were designed by almost by hand, except the outer and the so on. So it was that way, that um, so it was a, a really new new thing. The, uh, On peut parler d'une œuvre d'art totale mm -hmm. euh, pour ce palais du gouvernement euh, d'Oslo. Euh, qui, euh, qui donc a fait l'objet d'un bombardement, comme vous le rappeliez, euh, Sylvia, en 2011, mm -hmm. et, euh, et dont, euh, miraculeusement, euh, tout, euh, tous les murs euh, béto gravés mm -hmm. euh, par euh, Vicchio, par euh, Nejar, sont entièrement euh, debout, mm -hmm. euh, presque au milieu des, des ruines. Mm -hmm. euh, C'est-à-dire que le... C'était it's, 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 it juste parce que, aussi, le jour où la bombing a The telephone started ringing. Everybody and his grandmother rang. All the newspapers, thinking of the Carl and the and, and the the work. And he was totally mo not moved at all. He said, "I don't care about the work because I know it's cement. It will last." He was more worried about the people, and the tragedy of those people and those families, and so on. And and what happened afterwards, the consequences. So it, it was just, he knew, he, he knew that they would last, and they did, like you say. Mm -hmm. We've say we saw them. Yes, we, uh, we, I organized a trip to the government buildings when the uh, two curators were in Oslo last year. And it was very, very, it was my, the worst day of my life, for, for my, because I had never imagined it, it would be that way. So much destruction by one bomb. And of course, it's happened again here and then last week. So it's... Uh, oui, c'était une visite très, très émouvante, en effet. Mm -hmm. euh, Est-ce qu'il y a euh, encore des questions Jean-Louis Andral qui, qui, qui sort, qui, qui, qui quitte la pièce. Euh, il y avait une question au second rang, au deuxième rang. Vous vouliez poser une question Et puis ensuite, Peter Reed, et puis nous, nous passerons... Euh... Oui. Très vite, euh, je me demande s'il y a des échanges entre euh, les conservateurs des, de l'architecture et les conservateurs de la sculpture en béton. Parce que le problème des surfaces en béton, c'est un problème très, très, très grand dans l'architecture aujourd'hui. Donc, je voudrais savoir s'il y a des échanges. Alors, et par rapport aux œuvres qu'on a vues en général je ne sais pas répondre dans le sens que euh, je ne crois pas. Euh, moi, moi, je suis une historienne de l'architecture, donc je suis souvent en contact aussi avec les conservateurs, parce qu'en fait, j'ai fait des recherches aussi sur la technique, donc pour moi, c'est très utile de parler avec eux. Et, et ils m'enseignent beaucoup de choses. Et je connais les, les choses qui sont en train de faire les, les conservateurs d'architecture, mais jamais, je ne me suis jamais trouvée en face d'un cas dans lequel il y a un rapport direct entre les conservateurs de sculptures et d'architecture. Et ça, c'est dommage parce qu'en effet, le béton, c'est un problème. Le béton armé, c'est un problème. Mm. <rire> c'est aussi un problème de le restaurer et pour uh, sa con con conservation dans les tombes, dû surtout au fait qu'il y a béton plus métal et donc les deux matériaux eh, travaillent de manière différente dans les tombes et donc ils vont à, à, quand même à, à avoir des conflits les unes avec les autres. Et le problème c'est aussi que s'il faut refaire des parties en béton, on ne sait jamais comment les faire parce que c'est toujours des, des tâches sur la surface. Et en plus on a un travail de la surface soignée que c'est très difficile de, de reproduire. Et, mais je pense qu'il serait une belle occasion d'avoir une une conversation entre les conservateurs euh, des sculptures et, et, et d'architecture. Je pense qu'on pourrait se raconter beaucoup de choses importantes et peut-être arriver à des solutions. Yes, um, when we had to have our piece uh, conserved, our conservator consulted with uh, an architectural 
mm. conservator who advised what kinds of substances we could use or what kinds of uh, uh, processes and materials he thought would work best. And that was really, it was really wonderful uh, help, I must say. Yes. We had a call one time from uh, Barcelona because somebody had um, gone and uh, done graffiti on, on one of the, the panels. And then I rang the, actually, the grandson of um, the engineer still runs the firm in Oslo, the engineering firm that invented the process. So I rang him and I asked him, you know, what could they do? And he said that apparently there is a chemical now that can wash uh, graffiti off walls especially especially when it came to a work of art like Picasso's. So then I called back and they, I said, then use that. And they never called back, so I hope that it was okay. You know, it was <laughs> but apparently there is a chemical now that they can use to wash graffiti off walls. So that's a, that's a positive thing also. Merci beaucoup, Sylvia. Je ne sais pas je, si nous avons... Je, je crains, Peter, que... <laughs> Euh, donc merci, euh, merci infiniment à toutes les trois euh, pour vos interventions euh, passionnantes.